find Amos. Amos chapter 9 is the very last chapter. Let's read it together. Amos chapter 9, verse 11. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be. Verse 12. So that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord. When the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. Father, we ask that you would open the eyes of our heart. Open the eyes of our understanding. Lord, unless your spirit reveals your words, we just won't understand them. We ask this morning that you would reveal your words to us, through us, change us by your word. We don't ask you to convert your word to our lifestyle. We ask that our lifestyle be converted to your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, again, welcome everyone, and we welcome those who are joining online, live streaming this morning. Amos. Let's talk for a second about Amos. We're going to go to a New Testament text, and it's found, if we want to begin to look for it, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So Amos 9, 2 Corinthians 9, both chapter 9s. I'm doing an Old and a New Testament, putting them side by side this morning. I think Scripture's best related when we do that. One defines the other. So Amos, let's talk a little bit about Amos. He's uh, considered one of the minor prophets, not because he's minor by any stretch of the imagination. Amos was a shepherd, a farmer if you would, called by God to be a prophet to uh, the northern cities of Israel at a time when they were still pretty prosperous. They were just a matter of a few years away from uh, a tremendous upset, and many of them would be exiled. So, but they're still at, the, at somewhat the pinnacle of their, of their success. It's really hard to speak to people who don't think they need anything. You, you've tracking with me? I had a youth pastor working with me, and he says, how do you tell people they need Jesus when they think they have everything? It's a tough one. How do you tell them they need Jesus when they think they have everything? Well, he was was calling them out on this, and so he's preaching at the height of their prosperity. He's warning them because here's what had happened. Although they had prospered, they had prospered because they were living on the blessings of former generations who served God. So they had prospered. You always have these cycles of prosperity and demise. And so they they had had a run. But in their run, they neglected God. Not everybody, but most, many. And in their, neglection of, in their neglecting of God, Amos was saying, you've turned away from God. You are living selfishly. The tendency is when we prosper is we become self-absorbed. We think it's ours. We think we deserve it. And so Amos was calling them on it. Guys, you've turned away from God. It's, and the first eight chapters, read it. It's, it's heart-wrenching. As he calls them out, he calls them out, he calls them out, he calls them out. They don't listen, but he calls them out. That's what you do. You call them out anyway, even though many will not listen. Call them out, call them out, call them out. He gets to chapter 9 because he's finishing it off. He says, if you return, we did a series a little while ago on returning. If you return, if you do this, here's what will happen. And this is a tremendous part, these verses we just read. Let's do it again. Verse 11. Could we put this back? In that day, what's the day? The day of return. If you stop living for yourselves in your time of blessing, would you become caring again? If you turn your heart back to a caring people, in that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair. This is the Lord's. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, build it as it used to be. Down verse 13. The days are coming. This is a prophecy. The days are coming when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading the grapes. Now let's go to, and and the title of what I'm sharing is The Principle of Restoration. What does it look like to be restored? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Verse 10. Now he, God, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase, you can put the word in there, multiply your store of seeds 
and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I'm going to share quickly seven principles that flow out of this in regard to how does God restore in a time where we need restoration. But in this text in 2 Corinthians, can we go back and we we'll just look at this. Now, God supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Who does the supplying? Talk to me. I'm going to give lots of opportunity for talking here. God. God is the supplier. So we're managers, we're stewards. That's all we are. And that's a tremendous responsibility, by the way. But we are managers and stewards. God supplies the seed. So God supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food. Notice the seed. And then he says, and also supply and increase your store of seed. God supplies the seed. And, continues the second part, and will supply and increase or multiply, in other words, multiply your store of seed. You're going to have all kinds of seed. All kinds of seed. Now you're wondering, what's the seed coming to that? All kinds of seed. And will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Now think about this. He didn't say just enlarging the harvest of your righteousness. He will enlarge you in right living. He will enlarge you and there will be great harvest flowing out of it. So as you are enlarged, a harvest comes. So here's the thing. Sometimes we think God needs to move and he just needs to do supernaturally and he needs to move now. But guess what? He's waiting for the righteous. He's waiting for the righteous to begin to plant the seeds. There is no harvest if the righteous don't plant seeds. So he's maturing, he's raising you up, he's maturing, he's enlarging you so that there will be a harvest, but you are part of that harvest. When the body of Christ rises up in restoration, you can't stop the harvest. But when the body of Christ do not, this is what Amos was addressing, there is no harvest. There is no harvest. So he says, you enlarge the harvest of your races. This verse 11. You will be made rich in every way. Why? So that you can be generous. on every. So you're not made rich so that you can go and spend your weeks on the golf course. You're not made rich so that you can build a bigger house. You're not made rich so that you can buy a better car. You're not made rich so you can buy better clothes and better shoes. You're not made rich so that you can groom yourself with more costly stuff. You're not made rich in order for you to have a big retirement. None of those are bad in and of themselves, but that's not why he's going to do it. You are made rich, and he says it right here. It's not complicated. So that you can be generous on every occasion. So let me back that up, verse 11. You are made rich in every way. When I mention the word rich, okay, talk to me here. What comes to your mind? Okay, often money. So we think of rich money, wealth money, prosperous prosperity money. But we are rich in other ways, aren't we? So tell me in what other ways there is richness. Tell me what other ways. Yeah? Family? Okay, so let's think about this. What brings blessing and rich to our lives? Well, money's one of them. But often we get stuck there. No. A blessed family? I mean, we're, we're, we've talked about our, our grandbaby. Um, and, and, and we're just blessed. We're rich. We're rich with our, with our family. Uh, what about your health? You're, you're rich in health. Remember, rich is, is blessed. Rich means provided for. So your, your health, are, are you healthy? Are, are you doing okay? You know, there's a lot of people who aren't here. And that's where maybe they don't feel so rich. You're blessed. Your health Maybe you're rich and you were able to go to college or university. You're able to finish high school. How much of the world can't even go to high school? You got to finish it. Maybe go to college or university, get a degree. You're rich in being provided for in the means to be able to support yourself. Maybe you're rich in your job, that you have a job. How many people don't have a job? You have a job, and God is providing. Maybe you're rich. Some of you are in retirement. You've been, you're rich because God has provided and you testify the years he has provided for you. 
you, you, you're able to step back and now come and coach another generation. You're rich. There's so many different ways. You're rich in your giftings. What are your spiritual giftings? Remember back a while ago we talked of God is shaping us. He's spiritual giftings. He's working on our heart, our passion. He's taking that and developing our abilities, our personalities, our experience. God is shaping us. And so we're rich in all those things. And so your spiritual giftings, your giftings are God's richness in you. So let's go read this. You will be made rich. That's what it means when it says in every way. In every way. Don't limit your, don't limit your riches. Count your blessings. Name them. Count your riches. Count your blessings. Count your provisions. God has provided. So many ways. In every, so not, note that. He says in every way. Why? So that you can be generous when you want to. Is that what it says? So you can be generous when you feel you have extra. So you can be generous when you agree with what you want to be generous with. Oh, no, no, no. No conditions, if you want to read that here. So that you can be generous, here it says, in every occasion. On every occasion. Every occasion. How often do you think every occasion is? Every occasion. (laughs) It's not complicated. Every occasion. That means wherever there's need, there I am being generous. So, if you have the gift of teaching, then every time you're with somebody, opportunity just to share some things every occasion I don't get to choose and say no I think I'll teach I'll teach maybe once I I think I'll do it once a month or once every three months that's I'm comfortable with that I'll do one month every year of doing some teaching and if I've been given blessings in my spiritual giftings is it up to me to check pick and choose when I can do that Hmm. every occasion every occasion God has provided financial. Then why do I pick and choose when I give and when I don't give? Where does that come from? No, on every occasion, every occasion. If God has provided by blessings of family, then out of the family blessing, how can I continue to bless others? Every occasion. So, again, I go back through this. This is a really, you could spend the whole day on this one text here. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous. Generous, note the word generous. Not just crumbs, so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving. What will happen, and there will be such thanksgiving, there will be such blessing flow out of that. There will be a thankful heart, a peaceful heart, a joyful heart will flow out of that. This is a really good, I actually got this dropped onto my heart just right after Christmas, I think between Christmas and New Year's, 2020. And it dropped into my heart, this, this whole little passage, what I'm sharing today. I looked at it, and I pinned it, and I threw it ahead to, I don't know what it was, I think I threw it ahead to May, the month of May. I do that oftentimes. I know it's not to be preached now, I don't know when it's to be preached, but I, somewhere, and I don't want to forget about it because things change, I forget about it, so I threw it into my May calendar. So a May came up, and I looked at it, and I thought, oh, I'll throw it into July. <laughs> so I threw it into July. Okay, I'm just getting you a peek inside my head. And so it landed in the early part of July. And then in July, it it went there. And I looked at it, and I examined it. I was sharing with Lori, and I just was, and I realized this is the moment. It has to come alive. This is the moment that will result, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So let me just share, I want to share seven principles. Principle number one, the earth does what it was created to do. The earth does what it was created to do. Mark chapter 4, verse 26. Let's read this. He, Jesus, said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed in the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Verse 28, all by itself the soil produces grain. Now, I don't understand how all that works. And I'll be honest with you, 
I probably never will, and it's not a really high priority in my life to figure all that out. The soil, principle one, the earth does what it was created to do. The earth does what it was created to do. What was the earth created to do? The earth was created to nurture seed. So the earth can't produce any trees, any plants, any flowers, any life. The earth has no ability to do it unless it receives a seed. So the earth is the seed bed, but it is incapable of doing anything. So the earth was created to nurture the seed. Now, what's the purpose and nature of the seed? Very different than the earth. Yes, the seed has life in it, so the seed, purpose of the seed is to reproduce after its own kind. So it just doesn't give life. A seed can't, you know, give you a little squirrel. Uh, a seed can't, a, 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 a corn kernel can't give me a bean. So it has to produce after its own kind. So the ability of the seed is to reproduce after its own kind. So it's, it's inherent in that little seed. But the seed needs what in order for it to work? It needs the earth. It needs the soil. So the purpose of the soil is to nurture. The purpose of the seed is to reproduce life track with me here. We're connecting it to 2 Corinthians 9. Soil always tries to germinate a seed. You ever put a post in the ground? Maybe it's a fence post, your, uh, maybe your deck, and so you dug a hole, drilled a hole, put the post in, filled it in. A few years later, post falls over, a big windstorm falls over, you pull it out, it's all rotted. Why did it rot? It rotted because, because the soil was trying to germinate that post. That's what the soil does. It turn, you put a, you know, a, a car, you park a car, let the metal be in the ground, it'll take it back to itself. The earth will re-germinate it. That's what the earth does. That's what the earth does. The earth is there to germinate, to nurture, to germinate that which is there. It activates whatever's there, if it can be activated. Uh, I, um, I know when we were in uh, Cuba, they would cut down for fences. They would make fences, and they would cut limbs off of trees. And then they would strip them of their little branches and leaves, and they'd stick them in the ground and make fences. And they'd, you come back a year later. It's hilarious. Come back a year later, and they were all little trees. They were, they were post last year. They're little trees this year because there was still seed in that post. Now, when you did your fence post, when you did your deck, hopefully there still wasn't life and seed still in. But if there was, the earth would have germinated it. Because that's the power of the earth. It germinates the life in the seed. All right. So, life is in the seed. Nourishment is is in the soil. How long does a sower wait for a harvest when they sow their seeds into the soil? Well, normally, there's a season of planting, a season of growing, a season of harvest. Normally. But in Amos chapter 9, here's what happened. It gets mixed up. Chapter 9, verse 13, the days are coming. A prophecy. When the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading the grapes. The sower will overtake the reaper, he says here. It'll, It'll be happening so fast that there won't be seasons between. As one is taking place, the other is happening. God promised harvest is that sowing and reaping will happen at the same time. He promised a harvest through Amos. Now, some of that we saw realized at the time of the return of the exiles of Ezra in the time of Nehemiah. You read of it, and they returned back to their homeland, but it wasn't the full return. Some thought maybe it was when Jesus came and and gave his life, but there wasn't a great return. There was a great falling away. There was a revival, but there was also a great falling away at that time, too. No, they believe that this is still in the dispensation that you and I are in right now. That the great harvest spoken of in Amos chapter 9, where you will be planting with your left hand, you better have a sickle in your right because you're going to be, you're going to be scooping it back up. Planting, bringing in. Planting, bringing in. Planting. They will be mixed up. The harvest and the planting will all be together. The harvest will be being received. It's accelerated. The time is caught up in an accelerated process. Isaiah 58, 9 says, As we are crying, God will answer. Here I am. 
As you begin to cry out, you think you got a season. God's saying, I'm already, I might work right here. The immediacy of God's response time, God will restore suddenly. Restoration. Uh, another way of stating principle one here is God created the earth to nurture the seed. The need around us is for the seed to be nurtured. And God has created an environment by which if I plant my seed, think about this, your seeds, we have all got them, if you're followers of Christ, your seeds, when they're planted in need, harvest begins to take place. Brings me to principle number two. God will also give seed to the sowers and multiply their seed. Verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower, and that's God, and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. In other words, what it's saying here is whenever I sow seed, God comes alongside beside me and he's sowing seed with me. I'm not just planting my seed. God is planting seed beside me. I'm going to read that again. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. So as I begin to give, as Wayne Lucas, as you begin to serve, you begin to give of your seed, God is planting right beside you. That's called multiplication. He's not simply adding to what you put in, but you're going to see something beyond what you put in. This is the second point. God will give seed to the sower and multiply their seed. He comes along and sows as well. I'm trying to think of an illustration of this, and I, I remember when we were down south, we were uh, vacationing, and we were watching along Indian River in Florida, fishermen who would be fishing along uh, the shorelines. I saw a documentary one time in that same region on Indian River, and there's a bunch of fishermen, and they were fishing, and they weren't doing all that well, until one of them spotted something, a seasoned fisherman spotted something over by a log in the water. He quickly moved and the others moved over there. He threw his lure in and quickly it was taken. He pulled a fish out and the fish wasn't that big. I don't, it was certainly under, a, you know, probably 8 to 12 inches long, the fish. But he was pulling it out, so were the others pulling out a fish. He immediately unhooked the fish, dropped his lure, put the fish's lure, the 12 inch fish now's lure, threw the fish back in, boom, he had 24 to 36 inch fish coming off. And all of them were pulling them out. It was the most amazing. It happened in a matter of minutes. It was, it, was, it was like a frenzy. I was watching how they knew to just move over, shift over, throw in, pull out from that, throw in back again, and they caught what they needed to catch. This is the picture I, I see here of as you harvest, as you plant that seed, what that seed is comes out disproportionately to what you planted. Disproportionately. Comes out very differently. So, what will happen in these days? Before your seed can lead one hand, you are going to be reaping with the other. And you'll be sowing your testimony. Your testimony of where God has touched and healed you. You'll be sowing your testimony of salvation. And the lost will be coming to Christ. You'll be sowing the testimony of where he has bound up your wounds and healed your brokenness. And God will bind up wounds and heal brokenness in a disproportionate rate to even what you have shared. You will, you will sow your provision, you'll sow financially. You'll give some of your tithes and then you'll sow of your offering. And then disproportionately, you begin to see things begin to happen, provisions, things happening disproportionate to how you just sowed. We need to sow in both our times of abundance and in times of dryness. So, uh, why do we not tend to sow? A couple things came to mind. Fear, uh, fear of um, it, nothing will happen, fear of losing it all. And I think sometimes it's also greed, uh, selfishness, consuming. Uh, I don't want to. I just don't want to. Uh, and we come up with reasons why. Uh, Luke 6, 38, give, it will be given to you. So give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. With the measure you use, it will be measured back. Uh, you know, it's impossible to harvest if you've never sown. I do know that much. I know that as a farmer growing up, you never get a crop if you haven't planted a crop. It just doesn't work. So if I'm expecting a crop and I haven't planted a crop, I'm delusional. Principle number three. Stand firm on the truth 
in spite of the facts. Stand firm on the truth in spite of the facts. There's a story in 1 Kings chapter 17. It's a story of Elijah. And Elijah, in a time of famine, has visited this village. And there's a, a widow. She has no husband, no provision, no means. But it's in a time of famine. Really, nobody has anything anyway. And she has a young son. And they've run out of provision. They've run out of food. They are down to what would be their last meal. And Elijah shows up. The prophet shows up. And Elijah, in essence, says, you are about to consume your last meal. You're about to consume the seed. Would you, would you plant that? Would you sow that? Would you give that? Would you be generous? Would you give that away? And she does. And in that story, in, in 1 Kings chapter 17, in that story, she gives it away. And then she has, God, what he does is he takes that and he turns it around. And, you know, this scripture where I just finished reading uh, in Luke, uh, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, uh, God provided for her. Uh, why do people normally, what do people normally do in times of famine? Frequently, we ration. We ration. We hold back, we hunker down, we reserve until it runs out. And the point God is making that in times of famine, realize both in times of famine and in times of abundance, seeds have to be sown. If you're going to see restoration, sow seeds in every season. In every, where does that speak to us today? In whatever season, sow seeds. Sow seeds. God's miraculous power begins where our human strength ends. When we have done all that God requires, which is sow the seed, that's our part, we can wait for God to nourish it. We cannot command a harvest if we haven't first sown the seed in the season of our nothing. Brings me to principle number four. Sow when times are tough. <laughs> the truth about sowing and reaping remains constant in seasons of abundance and scarcity. When you sow, you reap. And again, we're not talking just money. We're talking your giftings. We're talking of your blessings. We're talking of your wisdom. We're talking of your coming alongside, your counsel, all those things. When you sow to them, you will reap both in abundance and in times of uh, when we are in scarcity. Uh, if you sow to famine, meaning you sow hardly anything into famine, you will reap hardly anything in famine. If you sow generously, whenever you give generously, and that's why Jesus would identify, and I think it was mentioned by Don when he shared that woman who gave a couple pennies. Jesus looked at that and says, she in her scarcity gave generously. So she'll receive generously. She won't receive scarcity. She'll receive gen. But if she withheld, she'll just receive scarcity. She'll continue to receive scarcity. Next principle. Principle number five. Don't eat your seed. In this particular story, it would have been easy for them to eat that last meal. But if they ate that last meal, then they wouldn't have had something to give away. Remember, if what is in your... Here's, here's, I heard somebody say this. If what is in your hand presently is not big enough to be your harvest, then count on it being your seed. Can I do that again? I know that kind of, If what's in your hand is not presently big enough to be your harvest, the widow and her son, it's not big enough. They didn't have enough for next week and the week after and the week after. It wasn't big enough. If what is in your hand presently is not big enough to be your harvest, then why don't you make it your seed? Make it your seed so you will have a harvest. Principle number six, lay hold of God's word. Mentioned last week when Pastor Brett and Trish spoke on bold faith. When they were in the midst of their turmoil on the Sea of Galilee, tossed to and fro, Jesus showed up and it was there they needed. Peter listened to the word when Jesus said, Peter, come. Comes down to listen to the word, lay hold of God's word. Peter was able to walk for that period of time because he laid hold of that word, Peter, come. And so he stepped out in very difficult circumstances. He followed the word. When he got his eyes off of the word, he, he, he fell into the water. But when he stayed true to the word, God's word comes back. God, I, I hold to this. I hold to this. The things that we're sharing today, I hold to that. I hold to your word, your living word. And the last point, prepare for the rain. Prepare for the harvest. Prepare for the blessing. If we go back to a text in Kings, 
where Elijah, in that same area where he was talking about the widow and the child, was also an area they had been in famine for many, many years. And Elijah turned to somebody and he said, uh, it's going to rain. And they laughed at him. He said, no, 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 you, you, better, you better prepare for it. And they looked around, the dust was up. You know, this is like no cloud in the sky. No, it's not going to rain. Elijah said, look, look, look for a cloud. Start looking, start preparing. And he couldn't see a cloud. Second time, couldn't see a cloud. Third time, fourth time, you know the story. Seventh time, saw a cloud in the distance. And Elijah basically said, you'd better run. You should have run when I asked you the first time. <laughs> but you didn't. No, you had to have living proof. So by the time you saw the cloud, guess what? It caught everybody off guard. They were unprepared. Elisha, who I really, really like, Elisha, his servant, he picked up on that. He took it one step further. He had a story. They were in a famine, and he said, God is going to begin to send the rain. But he went one step further. He said, you better start digging ditches right now. Better start digging ditches. And sure enough, you can guarantee it of all the naysayers around him going, no, it's not going to happen. We don't need to dig ditches. That's just going to burn out our energy. We're so tired. We are so thirsty. We don't have energy to dig ditches. And but you better start digging ditches. I remember when I was in the Philippines back when I was in team missions, when I was a teenager, uh, we were in a community just outside of Kababaran. And when we were setting up our tents, there was 18 tents. They were all pup tents, so uh, two of us in, per tent. And they're 18. We put them in a row, and it was hot. It was the end of July. So it's about this season, but, we're, but we were six degrees off the equator. Uh, really hot. We, and they said, Bill, you, got, you dig ditches. First thing you do, put your tent, and now dig a ditch. Run it out, off your tent. And I'll tell you, this guy did not want to dig a ditch. I thought that was so silly. We were already on high land. And why dig a ditch around the tent? But I wasn't in control. Somebody else was in control. They made us dig ditches around our, about a foot deep. And because we were in typhoon season. When typhoons hit, you really don't have much warning. And I remember when the typhoon hit. It was in the middle of the night. Typhoon hit. And the ditches overflowed. It came down so hard. The ditches overflowed. And it wiped out about six tenths, mine included. Six tenths. So the next three days, I slept somewhere else. Um, it came down so hard. Here's the thing. Here's the point being made. Prepare for it. Faith is when you believe, even though you don't see. But you just believe, according to God's word. As God is restoring in our day, as God is renewing in our day his promise that they would come. And as Amos spoke to a people that they were living in prosperity but living for themselves, he says, stop doing it. You've got to go back to what God has called. If he's going to repair, he will repair the broken, fallen down tent of David. He'll restore what is broken and wounded. He'll bring it back again. But you've got to start being generous. Thus, 2 Corinthians, that in every way you've been made rich, in every way, so that on every occasion, and might I suggest the occasions are right before us, plant the seeds of life that have been given, you, me, into the needs around us, because they're all around, aren't they? Plant them into the needs around us, and then prepare for the rain. Because as you'll be planting, you'll be bringing in a harvest. I was talking to somebody recently who was just on a retirement, just you know, not a whole lot of money coming in. But they saw a broadcast on TV of children over in another part of the world who families don't have clean water. I mean, that's in a lot of our world. And they're dying because of unclean water. And so the people on the television show, the, the Christian television broadcast, were saying, can you give $100? Can you give $500? Anyway, this person contacted me and said, I, and they didn't know how to set this in place, they contacted me and they said, I want to buy an entire well. And, and no, they're not overflowing in finances, but they've been provided for. I want to buy an entire well, $4,800 U.S. 40, for an entire well. And I'm thinking, I was, I was thinking of this, and I was thinking, as they plant, watch what God will do. The harvest people's lives. Thanksgiving will follow as you plant. In scarcity, you'll reap harvest and generosity. Father in heaven, I pray this morning 
But God, help us to understand the timing of this now and to understand maybe its personalness. It's easy to look at Amos and Corinthians and the different passages and to attribute that that is, that's for them. That's not for me. That's for the wealthy. But this is really for all of us. Lord, I pray that you would now grant each one of us that we would say, I will plant generosity in the time that the soil will do what it was meant to do. It will germinate whatever I plant into it. God, I pray we will see great increase, great increase in, in this community, great increase in our families, great increase in our workplaces, great increases in our neighborhoods, great increases in, in the life center that we are planting seeds into the life center and we're seeing increases, great increases into Cornerstone Church, great increases into our youth and our children. God, we pray, God, help us to plant that we would, in, out of our generosity, that, God, we would see as we plant, we will see the harvest come in at the same time. I'm just going to, sometimes what we don't do very often as a church is just give pause and, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our heart. So just as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I'm just going to, we're just going to pause for a few seconds. Would you just talk to the Lord? And here's the question. Lord, what do you want me to do? How can I be generous in every way? So I'm just going to pause here. Just talk to the Lord, just in quietness. How can I be generous in every way? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just talk to the Lord for a moment. Yes, Lord. So, Father, we know your Holy Spirit would reveal what his plans are. Just a nudge in her heart. Even as we look at how we've been blessed, then we know exactly what it is we have to plant. We just plant what we have. You've never asked for more. But, Lord, I pray that we will not in fear or even in self-consumption hold on that God we would give freely generously in this time of need we pray in Jesus name amen I invite you would you join me in standing we're going to sing that chorus again everything Lord you are everything to me the words in that song aren't they appropriate my treasure my priority who can compare to you Great is the measure of your royalty, O oh, morning star. You truly are everything. Out of that, out of that, I return it to you. Let's sing together. Everything. Everything, everything, Lord, you are everything to me. Everything. Everything, Lord, you are everything to me. Sing it again, everything to him. Everything, everything, Lord, you are everything to me. Everything. Lord, you are everything to my treasure, my treasure, my priority. Who can compare to you? Great is the measure of your royalty. star you truly are everything father we give back to you lord we know that you will take the seed the seeds of life that you've given us 
that God, whatever occasion that is now before us, that God, we return to you in spirit of generosity. God, we pray restoration. Bring restoration in our land. Bring restoration in this church. Bring restoration in our families. Bring restoration in our workplaces. Oh God, bring restoration in our schools and in our learning places. God, in our neighborhoods, we pray for restoration. In Aurora, Newmarket, Oak Ridge, it's God in this community. Bring restoration. Oh, by the Spirit of the living God. Lord, as we plant, we know that you're planting right alongside us. Lord, we know it's impossible to outgive you. But God, I pray, release a spirit of generosity. Spirit of generosity. That God, we plant the seeds of whatever those seeds are, of whatever is rich in our lives. That God, we plant it. Even in our seasons of scarcity, we plant it into the kingdom. Let it be, oh God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.